It's like Bruce Lee saying, you can hit a wall, but a wall won't hit you back. Uh -huh. right? You're not going to be a warrior if you're going to practice on a wooden dummy. You will have to have a person to interact with. There always right. has to be a feedback. Right. Um, mm -hmm. The same, I believe that there was also kind of a, um, there, there was also just kind of a, uh, an fMRI that they um, that they that they saw the effects of the, the cognitive effects of a child watching the cartoon versus watching the cartoon with uh, with the parent, and more parts of the brain were lighting up. If I knew that I was going to sit through a class that was dabbling in theory, that was basically reading out of a slideshow and telling you to read chapters of a book, I can do that very well by myself. I've, I have the proper uh, discipline to do that and to invite people to come and challenge me, which is what I'm trying to do right now with just basically educating myself on the science of storytelling and what are the cognitive um, mechanisms that are happening when you're telling a story and mm -hmm. what's happening when people are listening to your story. So what is happening there? You have, oh, wow, uh, you have so many uh, things that are happening at the same time. There's, uh, on the grander scale, when I'm telling you a story, um, the parts of your brain that are activated um, are the exact same parts that will be activated if you were to experience these things yourself. This is, this is one of the pieces of information that were kind of the key to me continuing on this path of storytelling. Uh, when you're reading a book, you're not, you're not just sitting there reading a book, you're involved with the character. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that read a science fiction uh, book have a certain after effect that lingers for days and maybe even months depending on the amount of impact because you just went through the experiences that the, other, that the characters in the book went through. Mm -hmm. You just had the same, rushes of dopamine, cortisol, oxytocin that would probably go through the minds of the characters mm -hmm. when they would be in that kind of danger. Mm -hmm. Conversationally speaking, one of the better one of the better tips that I give to people, especially men in a dating environment, but people in general is uh, uh, is is the art of storytelling and I I do not I'm pretty sure I do not do as good a job as you might do uh, given how much information you have in it but one of the things that I tell people is that there is three elements to it that if you can add, you will sure as hell captivate the fuck out of the other person. Make it visual. Mm -hmm. Describe how it was, right? Mm -hmm. So like, show it paint the fact that, yeah, paint the fact that the leaves were green and what shade of green, that really kicks it. Then make it audible, right? Mm -hmm. As to what you were listening to, what what was here, what, what could you hear? Were there birds around? Were you by a sea? Why, where did, could you hear the waves? Mm -hmm. And then three is describe the feeling. Mm -hmm. If you add these three aspects in a verbal, small ass conversation, right, the story is 10 times, f even 15 times better than just you saying, oh, I was there and then this happened and then I, and I banged my car into somebody else. <laughs> no, no, do not do that. You're being stupid as fuck. Describe the mm -hmm. color of your car. Make it happen. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's very interesting to know because like by, by that definition, you are almost sort of accumulating more experience through pages. And if you can do that, then and you And through are, people. And through people, yeah. Uh, you're experiencing it even more when you're hearing it uh, as a first-hand uh, story rather than hearing it on a screen. Uh, there, there are many, um, uh, there, there's a lot of research that comes behind this, like um, the difference between a child watching a cartoon and acting upon the message that the cartoon was saying versus uh, watching the cartoon alongside their parent mm -hmm. and what impact that had with them. So what impact did, was that? I don't remember it uh, to a very um, but what was that large detail, but yeah. just... Uh, the the message stayed more clear, and there was also more of a dynamic. A kid can um, a kid can interact with someone who also took in the information, meaning that there's more of a possibility of future interaction based on the information that was given. So there's the, that um, that exchange of information is necessary. It's like Bruce Lee saying, "You can hit a wall, but a wall won't hit you back." Uh -huh. Right. You're not going to be a warrior if you're going to practice on a wooden dummy. You will have to have a person to interact with. There always right. has to be a feedback. Right. Um, the same. I believe that there was also kind of a. There, there was also just kind of a, uh, an fMRI that they um, that they that they saw the effects of the the cognitive effects of a child watching the cartoon versus watching the cartoon with uh, with the parent, and more 
parts of the brain were lighting up. So with the parent turbines up with the parent, or with the parent, there was more parts of brain light. Yes, absolutely. Mm, okay. There's, there's more to kind of take in, and of course, the parent talks to the kid. Do you see? Do you see the information in front of you? What do you uh, think about the information? Right. Uh, there's there's a need for involvement. There's a need for an interaction. Uh -huh. So we can never get the um, the information that we're seeking if we're just listening to it passively from from a distance. Right. Okay. I, I think the worst um, sensation I had. Um, uh, or a pretty bad sensation was to sit in a classroom with 160 other kids and being the only one asking questions. Oh, I love just, it. Uh, well, it's, I need, I need contrast. I need someone to say, uh -huh. shut up. Yeah, you should definitely come for a club, bro. You should, awesome. Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd yeah, definitely I, like I, it. I know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think this Friday we are, if we are having a meeting at all this Friday, given the break, but this Friday we're going to be talking about sexual selection and how that plays out in the dating environment for some uh, somebody wanted to talk about that because some people feel like there are racial filters to it as well and that might be the case but we're going to we're going to discuss it out and the whole premise of the club is that you always want somebody to stand up and be like shut up you're wrong mm -hmm. this is what this is what i think and then somebody else will be like oh no you fucking shut <laughs> up right so we arrange it in yeah. a fashion like that too um yeah. and i i love the fact that i managed to convert that uh, fire that i was talking to you before mm -hmm. about the when someone says um, that about keyword the palestinian israeli palestinian conflict instead of that fire being a a hostile fire of i'm gonna i'm, I'm ready to fight you yeah it's or it's more like Oh, this is gonna be awesome. This is gonna be juicy. This is gonna right. be eventful. There's right. gonna be content. It's right. not gonna be a moment where we're just spatting things out. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not it's, me versus you. It's uh, it's not yeah. me and you. And it's not us reciting things. Right. We're right. Not thinking about the next thing we want to say. We're actually listening to the, to the other person. person. Yeah. 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 That's that's essential. That's so essential. Um, you see, that's what I thought Columbia would be. Uh -huh. I thought that I would have professors that would say, "No, I'm shut up." Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. You don't know what you're talking about. Right. Me, with 10 years of experience in academia and this subject that I've been um, fine-tuning for years, uh -huh. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Let uh -huh. me tell you what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I, didn't get, I didn't get that yet. Oh, I see. Um, kind of, um, if you know, do you know the book uh, Tuesdays with Murray? No, I've never heard. It's kind of like the, the, the romanticization of a, a um, what's the word? Mundanity? No, no, no. It's a um, platonic relationship between uh -huh. a student and his professor. And just kind of the love that exists there because the professor is kind of trying to get the person to open up and see the world uh -huh. for what it is. Mm. And, you know, I was hoping that mm. there would be more professors to kind of take me through that. Right. I was hoping to be carried more, right. which I understand now is it's not going never going to be the case. Never. Yeah, that's essentially Never going to be the case. I... I basically went on my path and I'm right here where I am now because I'm letting go of that. Uh -huh. In Israel, I was hoping to be carried by the ideal, by the story. I was hoping to be told where to go because it's so much easier, it's so much easier to take in right. passive information and relay it to the world. Right. To just reverberate. Right. Because it's, it's essential for your survival to be able to have people that share common ground with you. Mm -hmm. And I, it replicated very strongly in the army because mm -hmm. you have to repeat the information because there's life at stake. Mm -hmm. If you're not repeating the information as you heard it, uh, there's a strong cost. chance yeah. that, that there's going to be a very, very painful cost to mm -hmm. it. Um, and then when I set up on my own path, I was trying to figure out how to do it on my own and it's very hard. It's like learning how to walk. Mm -hmm. It's learning how to talk. You have to keep putting yourself out there, keep trying new things and keep getting feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's always kind of that back, that, that need in the back of the mind to be carried. But um, I really want to know, so what are you planning on doing in detail? Like, I want to know more about the details about your storytelling mm -hmm. uh, advent that you have, the enterprise that you have now. So this is really the first time in my life where I find uh, that this is a cause that I'm willing to give... Um, and I'm going to use the word sacrifice mm -hmm. because I'm living right now in a society of all of the I and it's hard to commit to one idea. This is an idea that I wish to commit to for, for the rest of my professional career as kind of the, the general point, mm -hmm. the, kind of like the, the pillar. 
on what I build, um, the media content that I create, the art that I create, the stories that I tell, and the books that I write. I want it to be on that foundation because I strongly believe that this is kind of one of the... No, I, I believe that this could be the key for what you would consider a next step in educating and um, empowering any generation to come. I think that we're, we're just... My feeling is that we're in a place in time where we can start taking responsibility and build these foundations that are more than what was inherited and more than what was given to us till now. The, the hate that comes around us, the, the, the pain that, that comes around, I'm just, I, I have a strong feeling, and this is what I want to connect to more, it doesn't have to be this painful. Doesn't, I don't want to have a person, um, a parent telling their child anymore, yeah, life is shit. <laughs> yeah. I just don't want that anymore. Because yeah. there's a child in, within me, and I, I'm accepting the fact that I'm a vulnerable fuck. Uh -huh. And I love it. Uh -huh. Because I get to say to myself, I don't want to live that life anymore. Uh -huh. I don't want to live the life where I'm saying everything is difficult. Every step that I take is going to be... Shitty um, and full of pain and just like all of that. 100%. Yeah. It's my hope that I take the Columbia education under the condition that I can have a place to build this idea mm -hmm. on a solid academic foundation. I have all of the components needed for proper research. I have a diverse set of kids from several parts of Manhattan and I can take it to other places once we, once we regulate it in Manhattan. I'm writing the curriculum now. Um, I have a I have a very diverse age range group. Uh -huh. I'm focusing now between five and seven, but I think corporate can be in storytelling. Uh -huh. uh, I was uh, training um, members of our team, um, and we were just cavemen for um, for the whole hour. Oh wow! Yeah. So it was just it's something that you can do. It's something that you can tap into for any age range. So I want to be able to start crunching numbers. Mm -hmm. I want to have kind of the academic background to say. Yeah, we've examined this in, in this angle as well. And I would love Columbia to participate in it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm still, I'm still struggling with the idea that because I'm an artist, because I'm a storyteller, I'm probably not going to go into finance. Mm -hmm. And because I'm not going to go into anything that involves finance or business, I'm still going to be in debt for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So is it proper for me to invest in an education that I'm probably not going to be able to live the liberated life that I've worked so hard to achieve? Mm -hmm. Probably at this pace, no. Mm -hmm. um, my last string of hope is getting in contact with um, Teachers College and try to route an express track uh, with a master's and hopefully a PhD that's all about developing this product mm -hmm. and making it solid enough for people to understand that yes this could be integrated into any educational system. Mm -hmm. My next step would probably be taking uh, whatever model I managed to construct either in New York, either in California, either in Israel, I don't care at this point, I just want this to happen mm -hmm. and start uh, getting feedback from other educational facilities around the world. Mm -hmm. I, want it to, I want it to withstand the trial of the different um, the different approaches to education right. that the world has come to offer. I mean, we're looking at only a very specific and focused westernized education, mm -hmm. but th there's so much out there that mm -hmm. I don't know and I want to be able to know. Right. I want to experience it, I want to live it, and I want to be able to bring something to play with. Right. Like you don't go to a baseball game without a glove expecting that you can play. Uh -huh. you know? right. So I want to be able to develop that tool right now so that I can come to these schools and say, hey, so ta ta tell us more about the tool. I'm very interested about like how you're going to go about doing this. Like, what is your what is the what is the idea that you're working on right now? Okay. So right now I'm taking something as simple as um, Aesop's Fables. It's uh -huh. a very famous um, Greek storyteller that yeah. has told um, stories that basically have lasted for these couple thousand years. Um, the famous ones include Taurus and the Hare. Uh -huh. um, 
what was it, The Boy Who Cried Wolf? Uh -huh. These are all Easy. fables that, uh, yeah. yeah. And they are probably reverberations of fables that have existed for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years beforehand. Right. Because the profession of, um, of uh, being a shepherd has been there for quite a while. And uh, tortoises and hares have been there quite a while. Right. Um, so I'm taking these simple fables and trying to get kids to um, also just put them in the story, put them in the narrative. Mm -hmm. Give them the properties that the main characters have and give them the fate, the same dilemmas. Simulate the same dilemmas and put it in language that uh, makes sense to them. So they're not only passively hearing it in a didactive sense, mm -hmm. they're not just hearing an oral representation of the story, they're actually embodying it. They're actually in the race. And let's, uh, let's take the story of the raven and uh, the jug of water. You mm -hmm. have a uh, raven that arrives, uh, or it could be a crow or a raven that arrives to a, um, to a dried up whale. Right. And next to the well there is a jug of water and the crow can't reach down towards the water because of its beak, its narrow beak. Right. So um, a lot of kids are not necessarily familiar with this fable, so I try to give them all the components that uh, lead them to the same conclusion that the crow did before telling them the, mm -hmm. um, the end of the story. So how do you think the crow handled that, for instance? Oh no, I, I know the story. Yeah, I was so, really, yeah. yeah. Grabs the pebbles right. and starts collecting the things. Easy does it. And the beauty of uh, this kind of storytelling is, one, they're doing it themselves. They start looking around in the classroom to uh, pebbles that have already planted inside. Mm -hmm. And they've already uh, gone, grown accustomed to the fact that uh, crows can collect things with their beak mm -hmm. because they're, they're experiencing it. They're, their hands are like this mm -hmm. and they're collecting items around the room mm -hmm. and putting in piles and concentrating it. So they already have the properties and um, they can face the same dilemmas. Mm -hmm. Um, and when they reach that resolution, it's that much stronger because they're the ones that are embodying the conclusions. They're the ones that are suffering the consequences, right. just like the, the characters in the story. So, how many uh, are you taking? Are you picking up all of Aesop's fables? Or are you take, are you taking a select few? Right now, it's a select few. Select yeah. few, because I'm pretty sure like some of his fables, like because when you said that these these stories have survived all this while. It's also the truth in these stories that has survived all these whiles, and they could they could have like a very beautiful interplay, right? So, for instance, it's like there is a reason why the boy who cried wolf has survived for all this while that it has, and that the the, the, the very reason why that happened is because it's teaching you the the consequences of of lying out of your ass mm -hmm. multiple times, and then you really facing that danger and not being able to resolve it because you expended the amount of help that you could have gotten from your community, right? So like some stories, because of the truths, they remain for a longer while. Mm -hmm. But that you have to factor in the fact that, that some stories, have you come across any that just might be redundant and like not, not worth investing in as well? Yeah, there, yeah. there are quite a few. There's, there's a lot of things that wouldn't be um, as efficiently translated into story, uh, into story form. Mm -hmm. I will say, um, so, uh, there's there's one with uh, the toad saying um, going to going to his mother and saying that there was a huge beast mm -hmm. that uh, trampled in the waters and nearly nearly killed him mm -hmm. and the toad the mother toad um, in pride swells herself up was he as big as this and he says no and then he swells herself more was she as big as this and he says no so she swells herself more until she explodes right. Um, That's tragic as fuck, bro. It's tragic as fuck. <laughs> uh, a lot of these fables could have kind of a, a bit of a, you know, a harsher truth than the kids would be accustomed to. Right. Them, particularly in those these ages. Times. Yeah. Yeah. In these ages, death is not the same experience. Uh -huh. I mean, we grew up with stories from Disney, and death is so apparent. Yeah. It's just the way that you tell it. It's the way that you present it. So it's also a challenge that I want to. I want to introduce death. I want to introduce concepts that are harsh in life in a way that a kid can um, at least extract it and put forth um, lessons that they'll learn later on. Mm -hmm. um, and that being said, you are not in control of what the child is going to interpret. Right. So the second part of the science is whatever story I'm telling you, and even though we're, we're activating the same uh, regions in our brain, we're not telling the same story at all. Uh -huh. You have your conclusions from The Boy Who Cries Wolf. I have my conclusions that also uh, include the fact that um, there, is, um, there is a battle between instant gratification and delayed gratification. 
The boy wants the uh, affirmation and the attention, right. rather than try to do his job. And with progression, with time, he'll gain that uh, right. respect right. because he'll mm. catch wolves in a span of thirty years rather than in a span of a week. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So you can take it anywhere you want. And the beauty of telling a story is you don't have to tell uh, the conclusion in the end of the fable. Right. You don't. Um, that play will do that for you. Mm -hmm. The, the reason why we play, the reason why we tell stories is because it's practicing, it's rehearsing. Mm -hmm. And rehearsing is never perfect. Mm -hmm. it's, it's how we tell the stories again mm -hmm. and again. Uh, the reason why I'm taking Aesop's Fables is because, just like a pop tune, it's catchy. Mm -hmm. And if it's catchy, it will resonate not only when they're five when they hear the story um, at the first time, it will resonate when they're ten and they get to look back at it. It will mm -hmm. resonate again when they're fifteen. Mm -hmm. One of the sh most powerful stories that I remember as a kid um, was The Giving Tree, mm -hmm. Shel Silverstein. I've never um, heard. It's all about a tree that um, gives everything in its power to a small boy mm -hmm. that it loves with all its heart. Mm -hmm. It gives, and as the boy grows older, it just comes back and asks the trees for more. It asks first for its apples, then it asks for the leaves and the branches, then it asks for the entire trunk. Mm -hmm. And then by the time that the boy is, uh, has grown old, he comes back and the tree has nothing to offer, just but a stump. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't... Um, it, it doesn't try to give you a lesson at the end of the story. Mm -hmm. It doesn't try to tell you what you should think. Mm -hmm. It just gives you the story mm -hmm. and allows you to to kind of put on your interpretation. Right. Which I is, was, when I was experimenting with art, when I used to write poetry, when I used to read a lot of poetry and like a lot of music, I've always been heavy on music. I felt, I felt that the, the the job of a true artist is to create a bracket within which you can find yourself. Mm -hmm. Your poetry needs only to be as vague to be sensible enough for somebody to find their sensibilities in it, right? So it's like, there's a reason why instrumental music um, evokes a, a more emotion in me now than it did then than lyrical music because it's like it allows me to write my own words in there mm -hmm. right and then there's songs like uh, Stare to Heaven why they've survived all these years is because it's vague enough for you to find what your Stare to Heaven is what the lady who's looking for gold is you know it, 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 it gives you the permission to do it because mm -hmm. if something was as linear as almost all of the pop songs that we see, why they have such a short life is because the meaning's so obvious, right? You you do not have time for reinvention with that. You do not have time to participate. Art 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 is a grander participation than just like one man vocalizing his ideas. It's if it was that it'd be academia. That's the very reason why it's not. It's a the reason why we've still not managed to grapple entirely with the idea of creativity is because it's inconstruable in words. It's, it's the power of insinuation. It's the power of suggestion. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean... I'm it's, it's like you're saying, this is why I love haikus. Mm -hmm. um, because they're so contained. Right, because yes. You can open up um, a scene in nature and uh -huh. take it anywhere you want, any uh -huh. direction you please. It's not gonna tell you what you need to do from there. Right. It's just going to show you a picture. Right. It's just going to paint you the picture and you take it from there. It has the limitation only enough mm -hmm. to show you a picture. But so uh, you are now transcribing Aesop's fable into a more interactive environment, you say, so that people can live through it? That's part one. That's part one. The real uh, point of this is that it's only a baseline. Uh -huh. My job is to play with kids. Right. And kids take it wherever. Right. Kids are going to come up with the different solutions. Uh -huh. uh, they're going to run around. They're going to want to continue to pick up things. And you know what? That's amazing. Uh -huh. that's, um, that's being able to track. That's using your hands. That's using your mind. That's working together for a common goal. Uh -huh. That's amazing in itself. If you manage to do that in the classroom, boom, you already um, made your quota mm -hmm. for the day. Mm -hmm. So it's just the baseline and around it you get to play. Right. So that's the, those are the brackets. Uh -huh. And from there, you take it anywhere. Right. Now, you could get to the conclusion at the end, uh -huh. which usually is always great because, um, you know, a skit that goes on and doesn't know how to end uh -huh. is, you know, just not funny. Right. Like, the joke is there and then just kind of... It's gone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And if you're fighting, 
this is what's wonderful about kids. They're just such an honest portrayal of themselves. Uh -huh. And if they don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it. Right. And if you're fighting against the wall, they're going to push hard. Right. So what you have to do is take a step back and say, okay, let's go there. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, let's go there. Oh, right. that's awesome. Oh, wait, how about this? Uh -huh. And then power of just playing and trailing along and taking them through the world. Uh -huh. So the second part of the storytelling dynamic is creating that baseline world. Uh -huh. Um, they know where the well is because we've established that there's a well. Mm -hmm. We know where the river is because we've established where the river and the mountains and the creatures and that exist. Right. And they get to play in the end. Right. So by the end of the twelfth story, they don't only have a collection of stories and the knowledge of different creatures that exist around the world. Because let's say if you're telling this to a three-year-old, you're playing with a three-year-old, they don't know necessarily what an ox is, mm -hmm. or a fox, I or know. a tiger, right? or a lion. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I don't tell a lion from a tiger. I'm there you go. It as fuck. Awesome. No, I can, man. I was just making that up. But yeah, I get there your point. <laughs> you got that. Okay. Yeah, for sure. As long as people can make fun of me, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. So wait, wait, how do you how do you plan on going about doing it too? Like because that's that that so like what are the the semantics of your interactive storytelling plan? Like how do you how do you implement it? So for instance, um, like we spoke about earlier, you have an idea of of recording scenes to represent haikus by themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, is that part two, by the way? Is that is that something you want to do on later and then focus on this the ASOPs aspect first? That's my own need for self expression. Oh, that's uh, your own so name. Storytelling is the professional fulfillment. Uh -huh. I have parts of my personality that, I, uh, that I've that i come to terms with uh, along the way mm -hmm. that I know need to come to certain gratifications. Mm -hmm. I have an adventurous side, so I always want to find places where I can push myself out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, someone invited me to um, um, out to, and we just said by... I don't know, just like um, a blabber out of things to take uh, post-it notes and write it and stick it on people passing by. Mm -hmm. And then we went and did it. Mm -hmm. I see. It was, that should have been fun. fun. You should have invited me, man. I would have been so down for that <laughs> shit. You have no idea. So I'm actually inviting friends to challenge me more. Right. To like take me on adventures. Because uh -huh. uh, I, I, that's one part that I love. Well, one of the things that I did not too long ago, uh, my grandparents had a 70th anniversary. <clears throat> I wanted to do something special, so I asked my family members to um, film themselves dancing. And I didn't want to be the schmuck that's dancing alone. Mm -hmm. I wanted to find someone to dance with, but I had no one. I tried scheduling it with friends, and they just copped out on mm -hmm. me. So I just go out one night um, to bars, and I start asking women casually, uh, listen, I'm doing this project for my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And I even show them a video of my grandparents dancing. Right. It's the best project. I'm, I'm it's sure. unbelievable, and I'm dancing with uh, with these random girls yeah. on the streets of New York yeah. because of the fact that there was a necessity for adventure and uh -huh. the necessity to to fulfill a goal. Uh -huh. um, so these haikus are a part of that, uh -huh. and they're also you get part that, of the Did you then finally get laid that night or no? Because I'm going to say yes to that question. I got, I got a few numbers. See, see, um, that's you just being humble, man. We know you got fucking laid. But did you eventually? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean that's yeah. the part that I'm still trying to figure out. As soon as somebody somebody gets into that that domain of discussion, I have this this separate part of my mind just to switch on, and I'm like, I'm <laughs> analyzing it in the, in the framework that I've established, yeah. and I can see the why that would work. It it has close to a perfect appeal as a mm -hmm. pickup line. If yeah. I, I hate using that term, but it has a very good appeal to that. But yeah, fuck fuck yes. So uh, how far are you into like constructing that curriculum? Like how much longer do you think will you need to do that? And when, when are we going to see this playing out? It's already playing out. Oh, it is? I'm in a company with um, a person that whoever that is kind of driving the train, mm -hmm. he's always going to push it forward. Mm -hmm. So we've already sold it to schools. We're already trying it out. Mm -hmm. So he's the person to kind of push me out of my comfort zone to a degree that is um, almost insane. But just enough for me to sit down and write curriculums. I already have 12 of these stories written out including uh, training sessions and there's also a biblical series with the synagogue that I'm working with mm -hmm. and I've already gone through a few of these and I'm receiving already feedback mm -hmm. and I have other uh, members of the company that are also already doing this so mm -hmm. they're giving me feedback mm -hmm. so it's happening mm -hmm. we're, we're ready this is what was kind of missing from my Columbia education was kind of the ability to to grasp it by the balls mm -hmm. and really work at it Mm -hmm. Not talk about it in theory in a classroom, not be in my own mind, but whether I want to or not, this already has legs. This is already walking. Mm -hmm. So I'm either on the train or I'm off, off the train. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you'd prefer to be on. 
right now, yeah. Yeah, fuck yeah. Absolutely. Bro. If, if this has the potential that I believe it does, uh -huh. um, yeah, I want to I wanna continue writing. Wow, man. That's yeah. fantastic. Hey, how long have you been on it, uh, at it? Um, it's been... I'm going to say about an hour and a half, an man. Hour, yeah. It's right. been a dope conversation. I've had a, I've, I mean, I could go on, but I have like yeah. commitments now. But honestly, man, it's been a pleasure. I wish you awesome. luck with all that what you're doing. Thanks. Get me involved with whatever you can. I'd be more than happy to, you know, help. So yeah, I'm looking for professors that are willing to take this on as a project uh -huh. to also help At me. Columbia? Write. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm looking for um, even off Columbia, whoever uh -huh. that I'm inviting anybody. This is what I love about uh, just being in the realm of creating. I'm not attached to being the sole proprietor. Mm -hmm. I want a person to work on the music. Mm -hmm. I think music has a strong correlation with activating um, a child. Uh -huh. So I need opening music. I need closing music. I need um, the, the music to be in the right place in the climax. Mm -hmm. I want set designs mm -hmm. that are flexible enough for me to be able to carry it on my bag uh -huh. and uh, dynamic enough for them to Believe serve it's for real. multiple yeah. purposes. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that potential. It could yeah. be a noodle, and then that could be a knife. It could be an axe. It could be a sword. It could be a tunnel. It could be a radio. It could be anything. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm trying to kind of narrow it down right now, working on uh, what are the items that a person needs uh -huh. to be a storyteller, mm -hmm. right? One of the uh, one of the main things that they're gonna have is a is a cloak. Right? Uh -huh. um, I'm looking also, like I said, so I'm looking for professors to also turn this into an academic experiment, so that I can start signing on kids to participate. Mm -hmm. and uh, send out surveys at the end of these classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I want to compile these surveys in an, in an academic standard that's an Ivy League standard. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if that's the highest that I can get to, then I want it to happen yeah. in the highest standards. Yeah. And I'm inviting people to put in their own impact. I'm inviting storytellers. I'm, starting, um, I'm inviting theater majors right. to come uh, and, and try this out. Right. Because this is very much an improvisation, right? This mm -hmm. is um, being the character. And if you're not believing in the character, uh, and this is one of the hardest parts as the storyteller. If you're not believing in the narrative, if you're not believing that there's a tiger right there, mm -hmm. then they're not going to believe. Yeah. They're not going to Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Um, regardless, man, that is just... Um, mm -hmm. I think I, this conversation turned out to be better than I thought it would be. And I had pretty high standards. So, like, by that definition, um, we've, we've pretty wow. much outdone ourselves. Awesome. Um, that's this is a bunch of questions in my mind, but I think we're gonna have to save it for some time else, man. Yeah. No, it's been an absolute fucking pleasure talking <laughs> to you, man. I hope you felt similarly. I hope you could like no, think this through your Yeah, you know, with all these lights, it's been interesting.